Hello, and welcome to this training session for Smart OAE by Intelligent Hearing Systems. Today, I will walk you through the software operation and analysis of distortion product and transient OAEs. But before we begin, let's review a bit of history. The OAE historical timeline begins in 1948 when Thomas Gold proposes an active cochlear process. In 1961, Becasey wins Nobel Prize in Medicine for his discovery of the physical mechanism of stimulation within the cochlea. In 1978, Kemp is first to describe OAEs. In 1983, Davis describes the cochlear amplifier, which means that the cochlea acts as an active biological process that enhances low-intensity sounds. The cochlea is passive above 60 dB. This, therefore, explains recruitment and OAEs. In 1985, Brownwell discovers motility of the outer hair cells. The outer hair cells contract with chemical, electrical, or acoustical mechanical stimulation. Contractions are synchronous with cochlear electrical activity. In 1988, the first commercial transient OAE comes to market. Intelligent Hearing System Smart DPOAE was FDA cleared in 1996, and the Smart Transient OAE module was cleared in 2002. Here we see the organ of Corti. The primary function of the organ of Corti is the transduction of auditory signals, and it is located in the cochlea. Here we find the structures of the outer hair cells and inner hair cells responsible for the OAE responses. As just mentioned previously, the role of the outer hair cell is to contract during low intensity stimulation to amplify sounds. Outer hair cells amplify hydromechanical responses that are transmitted through the cochlea and move the endolymph towards inner hair cells, enabling the inner hair cells to hear. Energy leaks back into the middle ear, resulting in OAE responses, which are the byproducts of mechanical properties and normal functioning of the outer hair cells. These responses can then be measured by an OAE probe microphone that is placed in the ear. IHS devices typically use the 10D OAE probe pictured here to clinically acquire OAE responses. A 10B plus probe microphone can also be used for research applications. How the probe is fitted into the ear canal is one of the most important parts of getting a fast and accurate OAE test. In a clinical setting, conduct an otoscopic examination to ensure that the ear canal is clean and clear before probe insertion and testing. At the insertion side of the 10D probe, you will find a disposable and replaceable probe cover tip. This tip must be clear of any debris or occlusion. The notch, along with the slider clips on the side, must click into place on the probe microphone casing in order to preserve a tight seal during testing. Do not compromise the rubber gasket. If this gasket shifts or moves, it can cause distortion to the output signal. Also, do not insert anything into the probe cover tip while it is connected to the probe microphone casing. There are a variety of ear tips you can choose from. Please visit our online catalog for a selection of available ear tips. Correct ear tip selection is critical for sealing the ear canal and obtaining good quality OAE measurements. Always use the largest size probe tip possible, since a tight seal will ensure a strong signal is sent into the patient's ear and help keep out any environmental noise from contaminating the response. When using the 10D OAE probe on newborns, ensure that when placing the ear tip on the probe that you leave a small cavity approximately one millimeter at the edge of the cover tip for the collection of vernix or fluid debris that may still be present in the ear canal after birth. This will ensure that the probe cover tip does not get occluded. Remember, the probe and ear tips are designed for ears and ear canals, thus they cannot hurt the patient's ears. Be sure the patient is quiet. This is an acoustical test that will be affected by acoustical noise, such as talking, coughing, snoring, even rattles of movement and any audible noise present in the environment. Continuous background noise should be avoided. Random noise can be overcome by averaging and rejection settings, but it is important that if background noise exceeds 50 dB SPL, 
Clinicians do not attempt testing. Find a quiet location first and instruct the patient to be as quiet and as still as possible during testing. Testing infants while they are sleeping is ideal. Also, we recommend having the newborn and infant swaddled, as this will help make sure that they don't move and knock the probe out of their ear during testing. Let's discuss the details of a good newborn probe fit. Newborn ear canals tend to be sticky. To address this, clinicians can massage the area in front of the ear in a circular motion for 10 to 15 seconds. Then gently pull out on the pinna or outer ear and rotate in a circular motion for a few seconds to unstick the ear canal before inserting the probe. When inserting the probe into the baby's ear, pull back and down on the pinna to fully open the ear canal and help obtain a good probe fit. Release the pinna after insertion, letting the ear canal fall snugly around the probe. As you insert the probe in the ear, use firm pressure while giving the probe a quarter turn. This creates a downward twisting motion which will help you to insert the probe far enough into the ear to obtain a tight seal. Aim the probe cover tip with ear tip towards the nose. To check if you have a good probe fit, gently tug on the probe after you've inserted it into the baby's ear. There should be resistance and it should not slide out easily. If it slides out easily, try again. You may need to use a larger sized ear tip. Do not hold the probe while you are administering an OE test. By holding the probe in the patient's ear, you may unintentionally push it against the wall of the ear canal, preventing a signal from getting through. You may also unintentionally create noise, which can interfere with testing. If the probe is properly placed in the patient's ear, it should stay in place by itself and you will not need to hold it. Clip the probe speaker box to the patient or side of the patient. If testing a baby, you can clip the probe to the baby's blanket or bassinet. This takes the weight off the probe microphone and keeps it from pulling out of a baby's ear. There are primarily two types of stimuli used for clinical OAE testing. Distortion product OAEs are based on two frequency-specific tone stimulations, where the relationship between the frequency pair is typically F2 equals 1.22 times F1. In contrast, transient OAEs use a single short duration 75 microsecond click or a frequency specific tone. Let's begin to review the Smart DPOE program. On the main page, you have access to new or open patient used to enter a new patient or load an existing patient followed by the parameters menu where you can program all your testing protocols. The acquire button leads to the acquire screen where you initiate tests and the display button leads you to the display screen where test measurements are loaded and compared and where data reports are printed from. When accessing the parameters menu, you will find that there are two modes available for setting up your test protocol. You can select the automated frequency option or the manual script option. When choosing the automated frequency option, the fields for sweeps, block size, and L1, L2 located in the general tab will become available. Here you can enter the total number of sweeps you wish to acquire in the sweeps field. If you wish to break up your acquisition of sweeps so as to increase your signal to noise ratio or cancel any noise contaminants, you can do so by using the block size field. In the example on the screen, sweeps and block size match at 16 sweeps, which means you're acquiring all desired sweeps at one time and will go through the frequency range once. But if block size would have been set to eight, then you would have acquired eight sweeps at every frequency pair selected and then cycled through the frequency pairs again, collecting a second set of eight sweeps to add up to your total 16 sweeps that were requested. Next, you can define your testing intensities. Typical clinical intensities used are L1 65 dB SPL and L2 55 dB SPL. Now let's discuss setting up your artifact rejection. At the beginning of the test, the microphone is turned on and three sweeps are acquired across the frequency range to measure the internal noise. 
this measurement is compared to an acceptable noise template. And if accepted, it is used to set up the artifact rejection region based on the decibel range entered by the user. In this example, the artifact field is set to 10 dB. This means if the average noise during testing is higher than the initial internal noise measurement by 10 dB, the blocks of sweeps will be rejected and the software will reacquire the block again, as many times as indicated by the retry field. In this example, retry is set to five times. If the software rejects all five batches of sweeps, it will store them in memory buffers and it will select the measurement with the best signal to noise measurement to display as the results. When using the automated frequency mode, the second tab of the parameters menu will be labeled frequency. It is here where you can enter your starting frequency and your ending frequency, as well as your frequency per octaves and your F2, F1 ratio. The software will automatically calculate your frequency pairs as well as your expected DP as shown on the right-hand side of the dialog window. You can also choose to present your test frequency to the ear of stimulation in a low frequency to high frequency sequence or in a high to low frequency sequence. If you choose to use the script mode, then certain parameters in the general tab will be grayed out and the frequency tab will no longer be available. Instead, it will be replaced with the script tab where you can define your protocol frequencies, intensities, and sweeps exactly as you want them on multiple data lines. You can use the Save Script and Load Script buttons to create and reuse script files. It is important to pause here and mention that the Smart DPOAE module offers a high-frequency option for clinical ototoxicity testing. When activated using the 10D probe, the dpgram frequency range will expand to 16 kHz. For researchers performing animal OAE testing, there are options to record responses to stimuli up to 32 kHz using a combination of a 10B plus probe microphone and special animal use only high frequency transducers. Moving on to the third tab of the parameters menu, we find the advanced fields where you are able to define the maximum output level and the ISI period. Please note you should never test beyond 75 dB SPL, otherwise you can create artificial distortions. Next, moving on to ear correction, not all ear canal volumes are the same. Therefore, the Smart DPOE software module offers in-ear auto calibration to account for variations in cavity volume after probe insertion. To activate this feature, simply check ear correction in this tab and then enter the allowable range for correction. The maximum allowable range is 20 dB SPL. The next tab of the parameter menu is the stopping criteria tab. Here you can select to stop acquiring at a given frequency on a pass at that frequency. This option is helpful in speeding up the test if you have selected to use block sizes in your acquisition paradigm. You can also select to stop acquiring on an overall pass or no chance to pass, and these decisions are based on user-defined passing criteria. The final tab in the parameters menu for setting up your testing protocols is the passing criteria and normative data selection options. Click Select Passing Criteria and Select Normative Data respectively to load the files you wish to link to your protocol. There are three passing criteria that you can select and define that will score each individual frequency response. The most important of these criteria is the minimum DP average amplitude value. Users with strict amplitude criteria might choose 0 dB SPL as the minimum amplitude that a response can have in order to be considered a response. Clinicians with more lenient criteria might set this number at minus 10 dB SPL. Those in the middle may choose minus 5 dB SPL. The second most important criteria is the signal to noise ratio or SNR, which is defined as the difference between the DPOAE average amplitude minus the amplitude of the average noise. It is universally accepted that this value be set at 6 dB SPL. The third criteria is optional and has to do with the monitoring of how variant the noise floor of the response measurement is. You can select to require that the response lie one standard deviation above the noise 
or multiple standard deviations above the noise. To disable this criteria, simply uncheck the DB minus NS in Units of Standard Deviation option. When activated, clinicians typically choose to set it to one standard deviation. After each response has been individually scored, you can then score the overall test results either by a percentage of all frequencies that have passed, a percentage that have passed in every octave, and or a percentage that have passed in a certain frequency range. Next, you can select your normative data file. IHS offers two sample files to choose from, or you can enter in your own norms. The first normative file is the smartoae.ndf file, and this one will provide two shaded areas. The top shaded region is the range where DPOAE responses for normal hearing adults typically fall, while the bottom shaded region is the range where typically acceptable noise floors occur. The second sample file is the gorga.ndf file, where a single shaded region is displayed and is based on the published norms by Dr. Michael Gorga. Responses that fall above the shaded region are indicative of a 95% certainty to be true DPOA responses, while those responses that fall below the shaded region are indicative of a 95% certainty to be absent responses. Responses that fall within the shaded region require other types of audiological test batteries to be conducted in order to determine whether they are or are not valid DPOA responses. Once all parameters have been set, save the protocol file via the Save button and name your protocol file. If you wish to load a previously saved protocol, simply click on the Load button to view and select from the list of available protocols. Begin testing by selecting the Acquire screen and choosing the right or left test ear button depending on the ear the probe is placed in. But before we initiate a test, let's review the general testing procedure in DPOAE. After probe insertion, you would select right or left ear to initiate the test. As mentioned earlier, the internal noise measurement is then taken and compared to a noise template. If the noise is too high, you will get a noise too high warning message and will be asked if you wish to stop or proceed with the test. If you stop the test to address the issue, we suggest that 1. You ensure that you are in a low noise testing environment. 2. You instruct the patient to be as quiet and as still as possible. And 3. You pick a larger ear tip that seals the ear canal better and then refit the probe with a deeper insertion. Next, the program evaluates if the ear correction in-ear calibration option has been turned on or not. If it is not checked or active, then the software proceeds to look for probe occlusion using the first test frequency pairs. If the measured value is 35 dB below the desired level, you will see a probe fit error message and the test will be stopped. If this happens, then check for 1. Probe microphone occlusion or an obstruction inside the ear canal that may be causing attenuation of sound. 2. Check if the probe has been placed against an ear canal wall. Try refitting the probe. Or 3. Check for technical issues such as the microphone may not be on or properly connected to the device or there may be damage to the probe or probe connections. If the ear correction option is turned on and checked in the protocol, the system will go through an in-ear calibration and will apply temporary correction values to the output levels. Then the system will perform the probe fit microphone check to verify if the measured value is below 35 dB as previously discussed. When the probe check passes, the software will evaluate if any of the frequency pairs required more correction than the value the clinician entered into the allowable ear correction range field, typically set to the maximum of 20 dB. If it did, you will see an informational warning statement stating that one or more correction values were too large, meaning that one or more frequency pairs required correction values larger than specified within the ear correction range of the protocol. Next, the test will begin. DPOAEs are generated by stimulating the cochlea with two frequencies at two intensities, where F2 is 1.22 times F1 and where F1 is typically delivered at 65 dB SPL, 
while F2 is delivered at 55 dB SPL, or 10 dBs apart. As the signals overlap, hair cell responses generate. These are referred to as distortion product pressure waves. With the strongest, most robust intermodulation distortion product emission in the cochlea being generated at 2F1 minus F2, as shown on the frequency spectrum. Now I'm going to walk you through a smart DPOE test. First, you must enter the patient information from the patient menu on the launch pad. Then, launch the smart DPOE software module. Click on the acquire button to enter the testing screen. Select parameters and click on the load button to view the list of protocol parameters you have previously programmed. Choose your test protocol by clicking on it until it highlights in blue. The bottom panel will show a summary of the acquisition parameters. Click OK to use that protocol for testing. Next, place the probe in the ear and then click on the test ear button that corresponds to the ear where the probe has been placed or fitted. In this example, I have placed and initiated the test in the left ear. The test will begin immediately upon pressing the test ear button. First, the system will check the probe fit and the status will be indicated under the stop pause button. In this case, our probe fit was OK. Then the program will take the initial noise measurement as shown with the purple line that is plotted across the DPGram. In-ear calibration is conducted next for each frequency pair to be tested in the protocol and corrections applied to meet target levels. Positive line means that the output sound needed to be increased at those frequency to meet target output levels. And negative lines means that the output sound needed to be decreased to meet target levels. Next, the test measurements are taken for each frequency pair. You can click on every point on the DPGram and view the table information, the spectrum, and the A1, A2 levels. Once the test is complete, move the probe to the opposite ear and select the corresponding test ear button to initiate the test again. When testing is complete, click on the display button to display side-by-side -side results for both ears. You can view the data table information for each ear and print the results with or without passing criteria. The Acquire screen is made up of four main information panels. The DPGram is where responses and noise floor information is plotted as seen on the left of the screen. Red triangles correspond to right ear responses and blue squares to left ear responses. If the red triangle or blue square is filled in color, this indicates that the data point is selected. You will see the spectrum display, microphone levels, and DP data information update based on that response measurement selection. You can click each point on the DPGram and the information will update accordingly. The dark green area represents the average noise floor and the light cyan color represents one standard deviation above the noise. The spectrum of the selected or active point will also be displayed with the side bin noise information, each bin represented by a thin vertical line on each side of the response bin. The two bins on either side of the response are not taken into account in the measurement and appear shaded in gray, but the next five bins on either side of those are used to measure the average noise and standard deviation. The level display shows your actual stimulus levels as measured by the microphone and are denoted on your data table and on this display as A1 and A2 values. For standard frequency range, minimal differences or variations of 1 to 3 dB of your target L1, L2 levels, as shown to the right, would not invalidate the results. But if you observe larger differences when compared to your desired L1, L2 levels, then the resulting DP for that specific frequency pair likely contains noise or a distortion. Large differences between the parameter levels and the actual levels are indicative of a sound output problem such as a blocked probe cover tip or bad probe placement. And the last important area of the screen is the DP data information panel where you will find information on the frequency pair of testing, DP frequency, DP amplitude, noise floor, 
signal-to-noise ratio, and the passing criteria indicator. You can display and print all recordings from the display page. Results are plotted on a DPGram with the frequency referenced at the F2 frequency because F2 is the closest site of stimulation. You can adjust the display options as well, such as showing or hiding the standard deviation display, internal noise measurement, history traces, and or normative data. You can also change your frequency and dB axis. A result data table will print out with every DPGram listing the F1, F2 frequency pairs along with the DP frequency, the total number of sweeps acquired, the desired output intensity levels L1 and L2, and the actual output levels. Then, the results will be shown as average DP amplitude, average noise floor amplitude, the signal to noise ratio, and whether the SNR criteria was met. In general, DPOAE results are best when normal hearing is defined between 20 and 30 dBHL. Absent responses are typically found at thresholds greater than 40 dB. DPOAEs can be used to predict magnitudes of hearing loss up to 60 dBHL. The Smart DPOAE software offers a high frequency modality. Clinically, it can be used for ototoxicity monitoring using a 10D probe. To enable this mode, you would activate or check the high frequency modality in the system menu, and this will allow you to test F2s up to 16 kHz. The DPGram will expand from the standard 12 kHz DPGram to the 16 kHz DPGram. For our animal researchers, a 10B plus probe microphone with applied microphone corrections and special animal-only high-frequency transducers are set up to test up to 32 kHz. The parameters menu will allow for the expanded frequency range. The Smart DPOE module also offers the ability to record input-output functions, where you can specify your start and end L1 and L2s along with the step size, as well as the frequency pair of testing and other parameters. It is important to calculate the number of points you wish to acquire for the I.O. function. Based on the number of points you want to acquire for your intensity series, make sure to set your frequency per octave accordingly in the parameters menu so that you are set up to acquire, as a minimum, those same number of potential frequency pairs. Next, check Test at one frequency only. You can click on the up-down arrows next to the next frequency to cycle through the frequency pair options until you arrive at the frequency pair that you want to acquire for your I.O. function. And then check Edit F1 and F2. This will select the frequency pair you have selected. Then save your I.O. protocol. Unlike the standard modality, all software functions are completed in the I.O. function screen. Run the test by selecting the test ear, then print your data from the same screen. Now let's move on to transient OAEs. Transient OAEs are generated by a nonlinear system that is stimulated by transient stimuli, enhanced by an active process of the outer hair cells, and measured as a reflection. There are three testing modalities available. The first one is nonlinear. It is used for high intensity recordings, such as the typical clinical TEOAE measurements that are taken at 80 to 95 dB SPL. The second modality is linear, used for low intensity testing, such as what is done for suppression testing at 65 dB SPL. The third modality is spontaneous. This mode does not use a stimulus to elicit a response. Instead, it records any response that may be present with or without a synchronization click. In the stimulus menu, you can set up various acquisition parameters, such as selecting your stimulus type, intensity, in-ear calibration range, rate, sweep count, probe selection, and probe check. TEOE responses are mostly click evoked at testing levels of 85 to 95 dB SPL using a 75 microsecond duration biphasic alternating click with spectral energy from 500 Hz to 5000 Hz. 
The nonlinear stimulation is used to reduce stimulus artifacts of high intensities. The amplifier settings, such as gain selection, can be set to be chosen automatically by the testing software, or it can be manually selected if that is of preference in the amplifier settings. All selections can be saved as part of your default settings in the protocol menu. After you have secured a good probe fit and conducted your probe check, you can begin testing. Let's acquire a TEOE. First, enter the patient's information and launch the TEOE software module. The TEOE software settings are defaulted to begin testing with a 75 microsecond click at 85 dB SPL. Thus, you are ready for testing and simply need to place the probe in the ear and initiate the test by clicking on the test ear button. The system will perform a probe check at the beginning and at the end of the test and will plot the TEOE response. Here are the acquisition and results for both ears. The probe is moved to the opposite ear when that ear is being tested. TEOE results are displayed in the time and frequency domain. In the time domain, you will see two overlapping waveforms. They represent half of the sweeps acquired and stored in buffer A and the other half of the sweeps stored and displayed in buffer B. As the TEOE response is acquired, the time domain response waveform can be thought of as an unrolling of the cochlea, where you see the high frequency base information on the front end of the response, followed by the low frequency apex information on the back end of the response. The software also displays the frequency spectrum of the time domain response waveform, which are inversely related to each other. The response is shown in yellow and the noise in green. Since we are primarily using a click stimulus to evoke the response, it can be divided into the five main frequency bands of the click stimulus, 1000 Hz, 1500 Hz, 2000 Hz, 3000 Hz, and 4000 Hz, to be used as part of the response determination and passing criteria. Responses are typically present when threshold is less than 25 dB. The passing criteria is defined in terms of minimum cross-correlation and minimum signal-to-noise ratio. Values of 80 for cross-correlation and 60 dB for SNR are typically used. Cross-correlation data is the reproducibility of the responses in buffer A and B. This means that you are requiring the time domain response to repeat within itself at least by 80%. A CC value of 1 means exact reproducibility. The second criteria is that the response amplitude must be above the noise amplitude by at least 6 dB. Responses are expected from normal middle ear and pure tone sensitivity of 25 dB HL. Responses are not expected from abnormal middle ear or cochlear hearing loss of 35 dB HL or greater. All of the main information is displayed right on the display screen, but if you wish to see more frequency-specific bin-by-bin information, you can display the Show Statistics option. The Smart TEOE software also provides graphical representation of the time frequency analysis and distributions for response, noise, and signal-to-noise ratio. Another option available for purchase on the Smart Transient OE software is the dual probe suppression testing option used to evaluate the olivocochlear reflex and efferent control of the auditory periphery. This measurement tool is used to understand the processes of efferent innervation and suppression, where masking causes suppression of outer hair cell amplification. It is by which we understand how the response is influenced by the temporal characteristics of the input and the effects of perception of speech and noise. Typically, 210Ds are configured as part of the specifications for this type of testing, and the dual probe option is enabled in the stimulation menu. The modality is then set to linear because this type of testing is conducted at a lower intensity of 65 dB SPL. A forward masking paradigm is used where the white noise masker signal is typically delivered for a duration of 400 milliseconds, then turned off for about 20 milliseconds prior to the click stimulus delivery. These parameters are set in the suppression menu. 
There are four suppression options. No suppression or baseline. Contralateral suppression, where the masker signal is delivered to the contralateral ear or opposite ear from the one being tested. Ipsilateral suppression, when the masker signal is delivered to the same ear being tested. And finally, bineural suppression, where the masker signal is delivered to both ears. Per Berlin and all, binaural masking noise is most effective in suppressing autoacoustic emissions. Once the parameters are set, click right or left on the main screen to acquire the data. IHS recommends that you right-click on the Time Domain Waveform and add a comment under the File Name Information submenu with the type of suppression used. This comment will appear listed on the Load Recordings display window and will ease file selection during the comparison and analysis processes. Once the data is acquired on the main screen, you can go to the Suppression menu to access the Suppression Analysis module. Within this module, you can load recordings from the file menu into two different buffers for comparison. Suppression analysis is typically done within a 10 millisecond window set from 8 milliseconds to 18 milliseconds. Analysis settings can then be set in the analysis menu. There are various display options within the suppression analysis module. In addition to the response comparisons, you can view coherence, phase, noise buffers, and frequency and timetables. Here's an example of two contralateral suppression responses compared to two baseline no suppression responses. The suppression effect is roughly about 2.9 dB. The legend for the suppression analysis is as follows. CXY is the measure of coherence or repeatability. RMS is the measure of root mean square. RMS A minus B is the measure of the noise suppression effect. Clinicians expect to see a 1 to 6 dB suppression with as little as 100 sweeps. RXY is the measure of the RMS coherence or repeatability. Delay is the measure of the phase shift. Here is an example of two ipsilateral suppression responses compared to two baseline no suppression responses. The suppression effect is a bit more than the contralateral comparison, with a suppression effect of roughly about 4.8 dB. Finally, here's the last example. Here we have two binaural suppression responses compared to two baseline no suppression responses. The suppression effect is greatest in the binaural suppression in comparison to the other two suppression modes, with a suppression effect of roughly about 5.5 dB. The last modality within the transient OE software module is the spontaneous modality. Spontaneous OEEs are low-level, narrow-band signals recorded in the external meatus in the absence of any stimulus or to a stimulus used to synchronize averaging, but response is recorded in a delayed time window when there is no stimuli. For spontaneous OEEs, prevalence is about 60 to 70 percent in young normal hearing adults. The number of responses vary from ear to ear and subject to subject. Their amplitude varies from minus 20 dBSPL to 20 dBSPL. They are more prevalent in women and show higher prevalence in the right ear. They typically cannot be observed in cases of hearing impairment of 25 dB or more in adults. If they are present, they can be used to predict ototoxicity since spontaneous OAEs will be the first OAEs to disappear in an ototoxic event. In conclusion, OAE testing is a great tool and provides valuable and clinically significant information. It is an important part of your test battery toolbox. OAE provides an objective measure of outer hair cell function. OAEs can confirm hearing loss from a range of patients from infants, young school aged children, to adults. It can also be used to test malingers. It is a great tool in determining hearing levels in difficult to test populations who cannot partake of behavioral testing and require an objective test measure. OAEs can also identify microcochlear frequency specific dysfunction, providing insight into notched hearing losses and other patterns of hearing losses, and can be indicative of changes to come in hearing status that may not have been manifested on the audiogram yet.
OAEs are very sensitive and identify the majority of cochlear pathology, such as hyperacusis or presbycusis. OAE testing is also useful as a monitor of change, as in the case of middle ear and PE tube status, progressive hearing losses, tinnitus, or ototoxicity monitoring. Transient OAE suppressions provide insight into the role of the efferent system. Recruitment, which is the abnormal growth of loudness and is only present in cochlear losses, is understood in this context. OAEs increase our appreciation of the peripheral auditory system and how it is affected by noise exposure, meniers and other diseases, and sudden idiopathic events. Finally, OAE measures are quick, relatively simple, and it is an inexpensive test to conduct. We hope you've enjoyed our Smart OAE training presentation. If you are interested in any of the compatible lines available from IHS, or if you're not currently a Duet user and would like more information on this innovative clinical solution, please contact our sales team at sales at ihsys.com or visit our website at www.ihsys.com. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions or suggestions, please contact our support team at support at ihsys.com.